welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the suicide of a young Iranian asylum seeker in Naura camp in Australia and about this bogus and dehumanizing criminalization of human beings and migrants and, and this idea that no one, no one is illegal. This week's interview is with Chinsi Ashuto, the editor of uh, Micro Mega on secularism, women's right and blasphemy. The Insane Fatwa is about a toll-free number to get any fatwa you need. For free. For free. And the slice of life is of people going on the streets of Turkey, celebrating gay pride, even though Erdogan banned it. Long live them. Stay with us. Don't go away. Faribors Karami, a 26-year-old Iranian asylum seeker, committed suicide and died at Naora Island. This is one of the islands in which Australia houses its asylum seekers. It's a concentration camp. But keeping people keep Definitely. incarcerated and take away the liberty for many, many years. Young people being kept there and it's just unbearable. Yeah. People are either perishing away mental health is high, suicide is high, and how could, you know, Australian government justify it, how could the world sit and just continuously tolerate and accept, you know, concentration and of human beings who haven't committed any crime? And of course, this is a major issue that human beings are being labeled illegal. It gives the impression that they are criminals, they are being criminalized, and the only difference between them and you and me is one document. They don't have a visa or a travel document, and we do. Uh, for example, people who are living in Europe today. And so that's really the only difference. And it's sort of like, it reminds me of, uh, let's say if you haven't paid your TV license, you know, it's, you, you could say illegal, but you wouldn't accept being shot at the border because of it or having your child torn away from you and put in cages for months on end. But just because of this label of illegality, asylum seekers and refugees and migrants are so dehumanized and considered so subhuman that it is now all right to do anything with them and people just sit by and watch. Yeah, and, and we've seen the gradual you know, change in the status of people uh, and dehumanization of whole group of people. It seems that only now, it seems that only people who, uh, American citizens, European citizens, Australians, they're the only ones who are not illegal. Everybody else yes, yes. is illegal. Yes. And this is fundamentally wrong to take away the liberty of, fundamental liberty of people and brand them as illegal. No human being is illegal. And of course, you have people commenting that, well, they knew Australians' uh, foreign uh, you know, policy towards asylum seekers, uh, Faribors and his mother and his 12-year-old brother should never have come. They, they should know better. And it's sort of like saying, well, women in Iran should know better than defying compulsory rules because they will that's get arrested. The, that's uh, the law in Iran. But that's the law. People who fought against racial apartheid should have known better and not done it. People who are against slavery should have known better and not done it. There's a poster by a protester at one of these protests against uh, Trump's policy saying, those who rescued Anne Frank were doing something illegal. Those who killed her were doing something legal. So hiding behind legality and illegality is bogus. We need to see what are principled, decent human rights and uh, human principles and values that we need to protect. Uh, absolutely. A law that dehumanizes, that takes away your fundamental freedom and liberty, it's, it's wrong. And it needs to be broken. That's not a law worthy of respect. In this, for, at least recently, we, we've, we've heard that the European uh, ministers, you know, they, they've been sitting for nine hours, up to small, you know, hours of, you know, uh, they, they've agreed that they are going to now, uh, um, they've agreed that they want to have a clear, clearing sort of sites like a camps in, within Europe and to pay Turkey uh, and countries like Turkey uh, to uh, create camps and keep asylum seekers and refugees away from the European uh, borders and in effectively concentration camps. The idea of creating concentration camps 
to keep asylum seekers. It's becoming a norm, and that's yeah. the biggest disaster and, and a step back that we, we are witnessing yeah. in the last few years. I mean, one of the things, too, is that during the Cold War, you know, Oh, the Western governments opened their arms to migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, because they wanted to say that they were pro-rights vis-a-vis the Soviet Union at the time. But since the end of the Cold War, we've seen a constant a attack on and a chipping away of the right to movement, of the right to asylum, and uh, to be protected uh, from fear, from um, you know insecurities, dictatorships, and so on and so forth. And of course, these are the latest steps. And because there is this sort of, uh, there's become this sort of culture that make, uh, finds it acceptable, I think it's giving governments the green light. And I do want to just say something here about identity politics, because when you've got progressive people defending culture and religion, despite anything that goes on in the so-called com you know minority communities, the other side of this is basically white nationalists defending their white culture and closing borders and making it acceptable to prevent, you know, those barbarian hordes from entering Europe and the West as well. So it's two sides of the same coin, the sort of defense of difference and superiority, and it's hugely dangerous. Absolutely. When you hear mother of Faribors who has been in the camp and she is still in the camp, Australian concentration camp, and she explains her life has been completely, it's been ruined. They're not giving the body of her children to her to bury, and she said that she she's not going to give up till she gets the body of her 26-year-old mm. who committed suicide. Um, effectively, he was murdered by the Australian uh, um, immigration policy. Definitely, he was murdered. And definitely. she's saying yeah. she she wants to bury yeah. her child. Yeah. Uh, in, neither in Iran, no, in in that camp, the concentration camp, and she has the right. We need to highlight her her, her plight, her family, and thousands of others who kept in various concentration camps. Now you've seen that in America. Yeah, I mean they're they're building children. tent cities as Absolutely. well for children that they've segregated and separated from their parents. Imagine the anguish of a child being yeah. torn away. They're taking children five, six, seven-year-olds to court yeah. and they're, they're being no questioned with no representation. With no rep this is outrageous. I mean, don't forget they come for the weakest in any society first and they will be coming for you next. I mean, that's one reality. The other is that human rights is for everyone. It's not just for someone who's got a US and an Australian and a British passport. It is for everyone. It is for everyone. And I think that is important to, to see our common humanity, to stand up for the most vulnerable. People who are fleeing very often from, by the way, Western government policies as well, you know, like the people f fleeing from Guatemala, from South America, trying to enter the U.S. Do you know what devastation U.S. militarism and imperialism has caused in that region? And now, you know, let, let's tear people away from their parents and not give them the protection that they deserve. And let's not mention Syria. Let's not mention Iraq. Let's not mention uh, Afghanistan and the Middle East. That's just, you know, that's just recent history and in, in front of everybody to see. Mm. We must defend fundamentals of human rights. Human rights is for everybody, and no if, no but. And of course, the resistance is there. It's growing, and long live those who are standing with migrants, with asylum seekers, with refugees, saying that no one, no human being is illegal. Viva Patricia Teresa Akumo, who went and climbed on the Statue of Liberty and said she won't come down until the children are released from detention. Long live all of those standing up in protests across the world. And of course, you know, in the United States, you have the lead of the Hamilton play singing a lullaby for, for the children in detention who cannot hear lullabies from their parents. So long live that solidarity. That solidarity and resistance has to continue until the day anyone who says someone is illegal will be shamed in the same way that people were shamed when they spoke about LGBT or black people or women in a derogatory manner. No one, no one is illegal. Shoot.
Kito, it's such a pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to ask you about why you say long live blasphemy. Why is that so important? Um, I think that in uh, even in our secularized societies, religions enjoy many privileges. And one of them, one of the biggest, is the, their claim to be respected. And this is a greater respect, uh, uh, it goes without saying, uh, than that, that that we reserve to other uh, systems of thought, uh, philosophies, and so, and so on. And in fast all the legal systems in the world, uh, blasphemy, um, offending God, um, is a crime. And the range of the penalties go from fines to prison and even death. And I think that even only one person in the world risks his or her life uh, because saying something that someone else considers an offense to his uh, religious feelings, I think it's our duty fighting for freedom of expression and freedom of blasphemy. Well, what do you say to people who say, uh, why offend other people? Why not just try not to hurt other people's feelings? Um, yeah, this is the main argument in support of these laws. I think we should distinguish an offense and a direct offense to a person in flesh and a critic or an offense to a system of ideas and religions and philosophies and also to uh, abstract and imaginary entities. They are two different things. And second, and above all, um, the distinction between an offence and a legitimate critic uh, cannot be made uh, by the same person who feels offended. As an artist, I feel myself offended every day from religious expressions. But I would never pretend to make my own personal feelings the parameter of the law, because I think that in the uh, public space, in the public debate, nothing should be holy. Um, given the role of the Vatican and the Catholic Church here in Italy, uh, is it difficult to blaspheme here? Um, so, in Italy, um, blasphemy is still a crime, but uh, we get only uh, a fine, a little fine for that. Um, the problem is to find the limits of this crime. In Italy we had some sentences uh, that said that blaspheming Mary, for example, uh, is not a crime, because technically Mary is not a god, is not a divinity. So you can, uh, you can offend Mary with impunity in Italy, for example. Um, and obviously, the Catholic Church presses the societies uh, to limit uh, freedom of expression uh, with regard to religion and God. My fear is that in this uh, conservative struggle, the Catholic Church will find uh, new allies in um, other religions, Islam for, for example. I remember uh, in, the, in the case of the Danish cartoons uh, on uh, Muhammad, or also in the case of Charlie Hebdo, some members of the Catholic Church uh, made a statement in defense of the uh, Muslim uh, religious feelings offended. And I think this uh, holy alliance uh, against uh, freedom of expression is very dangerous. And you, you talk about one way of challenging uh, blasphemy laws. Uh, and that's the um, spaghetti monster <laughs> and the god of uh, the spaghetti monster. Can you explain that? Because it's quite funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, and serious. I and serious, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and a very, a very good idea, I think, to, to fight for freedom of expression. The uh, Flying Spaghetti Monster Church uh, is a religion founded by a physicist in the uh, USA, uh, Bobby Henderson. 
some years ago, the um, Ministry of Education in Kansas introduced uh, uh, the creationism into public school um, uh, with, um, with um, the theory of evolution because they say that they are both uh, theories and we should, uh, we should teach both. Uh, this Bobby Henderson uh, wrote a letter to the ministry saying, uh, um, hi, I have a theory too. My church have a theory, has a theory too uh, about the origin of the world and of the life. And uh, I ask, in the name of the principle of equality, I ask uh, that my theory uh, should be taught too in the public schools. And since then, uh, the Pastafariani, so they are called, <laughs> uh, they have spread throughout uh, the world and uh, they carry on these battles to show uh, this regime of privileges of religions. For example, I give you an example. Um, Lindsay Miller is a woman, an adept of the church. And she, in uh, Massachusetts, she obtained uh, the permission to wear a colander uh, on her head in the driving license. <laughs> uh, as you know, in Massachusetts, as in many other countries, uh, wearing something on the head in documents is forbidden, except for religious reasons. And the colander is the religious symbol of the Pastafariani, so she obtained the permission. That's the way in which they struggle for freedom of expression. And it's a very good way of making fun as well, isn't it? Because yeah. I think comedy is can be so blasphemous. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Charlie Hebdo, the Danish cartoons, they show this that uh, the uh, it's uh, funny fun, in the funny way to struggle for freedom of expression is one of the best way to do it. Mm. And uh, we're in uh, s uh, in Cagliari now. You're going to be speaking on the issue of atheism and gender. Uh, tell yeah. us a bit about uh, what you're going to be speaking on and why that's so important. Yeah, I think that uh, women are the first victims of every fundamentalism all over the world. From Poland to Iran, we say that. And um, I think that, femi I'm really convinced that feminism can only be secular. It means that only in a, frame war, in a frame of a secular state, we can guarantee, we can defend uh, women's rights. A secular state means a state where religions find they, their space in private life. And above all, it's a place where no der derogation at all is granted for religious, cultural, traditional reasons to violations of human rights of individuals. Human rights of individuals, first of all, and then cultures, religions, and traditions. This secular framework is the same framework where we can defend the non-believers' rights. So these two battles, non-believers' rights and women's rights, they go together. You're the editor of Micromega, mm -hmm. uh, which is a journal that deals with a lot of uh, sort of taboo issues. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain what it is and why it's important to, to have this sort of journal? Micromega is, um, I think, one of the, maybe the only one journal in Italy uh, that uh, struggles daily for a secular society, very, very strong and very clear without derogation at all and uh, I think it's uh, and it's also um, a leftist journal and it's quite important because the secular struggle um, is something that the left uh, his, um, um, is abounded mm -hmm. uh, exactly and uh, I think we need uh, that the left remembers again that a secular struggle is a leftist struggle. And I guess as a final question, I want to ask you about the new uh, government in Italy. Yeah. It's a far-right government, uh, and uh, uh, what 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 does that mean for the future of secularists, of uh, blasphemers? Because I'm, I'm, I'm obviously they'll be very close with the Catholic Church, I'm sure. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. how 
very near to the Catholic Church will be uh, because of Francesco. Uh, the, the, way, the way in which uh, Lega Nord is a Catholic uh, party is a little bit um, different from the way in which Francesco think uh, the church. But I think it's very dangerous, this government, for uh, women rights, secular societies, uh, non-believers' rights, and so on, the freedom of expression, and so on. And I give you an, ex uh, an example, Matteo. Matteo Salvini, which is the leader of Lega, and uh, since today he is the uh, new Minister of Home Affairs, um, he uh, presented himself during the last um, electoral campaign, presented himself on a stage, waving the Italian constitution in one end and the gospel in the other end. I think that politics that refers uh, in such a way to religion is very, very dangerous. It scares me because that has very little to do with faith and uh, it's an appeal to, uh, to nationalism and xenophobia and it's very very dangerous in a country as Italy that becomes even more uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious. Um, and I think with this government we will have a very very dark season for women rights, uh, non-believers rights, secularism and it means that our struggle for freedom of expression and a secular society will be even more necessary. One final, final question is the need for blasphemy and criticism of religion and even the religion of minorities uh, in a context where you have the far right in power. Uh, that's a very difficult situation for, for us uh, who are anti-racist but also want to be able to criticize religion how to deal with this situation? I think, I, I don't see any difficulties. There are others who see uh, these difficulties. Um, I think that the struggles of minorities are not always progressive struggles. Minorities could be um, conservative too. And uh, I think uh, our uh, target uh, should always be uh, the right of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, the individuals are in majorities, but they are also in minorities. And um, above all, the so-called minorities community, for the individuals of these communities, they are a power above the individuals. So I fight for the rights of individuals. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Now we've got some great news for you. The UAE has a toll-free number. Free? Free, completely free. No charge. Free. No charge. 1-800 number you can call to ask for any fatwa. It's so useful. It's free. It's free. And what type of sort of fatwas can you anything, ask for? Anything. Business, uh, family affairs, uh, women's issues. For free? For free. How to beat your wife for free? It's all free. Oh my God, yes. It's, it's lovely. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's actually very, very useful. And what's interesting is they say that they're using the latest communication tools. All, everything is classified and documented and archived. And it's all free? It's all free. Fatwa for free. He's not going to charge you a penny. Stupidest, stupidest fatwas for the stupidest, stupidest people. The length they go to to send you a free, free. fatwa. No, thank you. The good thing is it's free. free. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. came out on the streets of Turkey in order to celebrate gay pride even though it had been banned in Turkey by Erdogan because of public safety issues. Who could, who could uh, threaten public safety more than Erdogan in Turkish society? Definitely. Uh, pride is a source of celebrating love and solidarity and that makes actually every society better safer where people can express the feeling and emotion openly 
in public and that's a great thing to celebrate. Yeah and of course we know that pride celebrations and marches are taking place across the globe. We'll tell you about the London March next week and of course unfortunately in some societies like in Iran it's punishable by death, people can't march publicly but there's a lot of support and solidarity for LGBT and hopefully that will continue and it will be a stronger yes. movement and in the future. We hope to see Pride March in Iran one day soon. That would be lovely. This brings us to the end of uh, this week's program. Until next week, from me and Mariam, goodbye. Bye. fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are an alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.